Hey guys, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you might be joining us from in the world today. My name is Meg Alexander. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am, as always, honored and excited to get to start another fabulous Power to Fly Chat and Learn virtual event. Now, before we dive into our uh, our subject today, um, I want to go over just a couple quick things. Um, real fast, I'm going to show you our code of conduct here. Uh, this is especially important if, um, you know, maybe you've never attended a Power to Fly event before. The basic thing that it boils down to is just don't be a jerk, all right? As always, when we are interacting with our fellow attendees or networking with speakers, just make sure that we are leading from a place of kindness and respect. If you have any questions on this, please feel free to DM me in the chat. Now, this will give you kind of the lay of the land today. This will be especially helpful if this is your first Power to Fly event. And if that's the case, then hi, welcome. We're so happy to meet you today. Now, the love is no less real for my frequent flyers. I love seeing all of your um, familiar names and faces and avatars in the chat. So thank you all of you for joining us today. Now, as we go through, um, I want to encourage y'all to participate in today's event. You can do that in any number of ways, but we've got a couple options for you. Um, if you would like, you are always encouraged to turn your cameras on um, and share your smiling, maskless faces with us safely. Now, there is no pressure to be Instagram perfect, y'all. Just because I got fancy and showered yesterday does not mean you cannot bring your messy buns, your bathrobes, your furry coworkers, whatever you've got going on, okay? We don't care if you are in the corner office or on your living room couch. We want to meet you where you are so that you can learn with us. Now, if you don't wanna turn your cameras on, you don't have to. It's no, no pressure, y'all. You are always welcome to participate in other ways. Um, in fact, you're very much encouraged to head over to the group chat uh, and let us know where you're joining from there. I see my, uh, my friend Rhea is in the chat as well. She's sharing prompts for y'all. Um, and I would absolutely love, love, love uh, to, to see how many, um, how many people wanna chime in in that chat as well. So let us know where you're joining us from. Um, I'm coming to you from Toledo, Ohio. This is land that belonged to the Fox, Kickapoo, and Potawatomi tribes in my area. Um, we would absolutely love, love, love for y'all to share where you are joining us from as well. Oh, Viviana's coming from New Jersey. Awesome. Thank you so much for chiming in here, y'all. Oh, Jeffress is also coming in from Puerto Vallarta. Thank you. So I love seeing all of our, our new people. So thank you all so much for joining. Now, we are recording today. And what that means for you is you don't have to take notes. You get to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation that I'm about to have with Maka today. Now, don't worry if you miss a, a link or a resource that someone um, that someone mentions. We're going to be sh sending everybody a link to rewatch this recording, um, usually in about four to five business days. But if you want to, let's say that you want to share something that you heard on today's session and you don't want to wait four to five days, that's okay. You don't have to. You can always head to our YouTube channel. Um, we are recording, sorry, we're recording to, to YouTube, but we're live streaming there right now. Hi, YouTube. Um, and you can always find our videos posted there, usually by the end of day. Um, and then, like I said, that email for when it's posted on powertofly.com, that'll come to everybody that registered, whether you joined us or not, uh, in about four to five business days. Now, I do very much recommend that you check out powertofly.com. Obviously, there is a wealth of information there. All of our resources are housed there. Uh, but let's, you know, don't forget the YouTube channel as well. It is a great place to see some of our kind of greatest hits. Um, we have a lot of our very popular videos are housed there as well. Now, um, as we go on and introduce you to our speaker, uh, before we do, I just want to highlight that Maka is here today on behalf of Avo Academy. Um, now, Maka is going to tell us a little bit more about Avo Academy and what that means uh, and what y'all can uh, should learn and know about them today. Um, but before we do that, I want to introduce you to our speaker. Now, Maka is the founder of Ab Academy. Now, as an accomplished UX UI designer and a lifelong teacher, Maka combined her passions and created a community to help learners join the next generation of UX designers. Maka, I am really excited to get to speak with you today um, and learn from you. But before we do that, is there anything else that you would like our audience members to know about you today? Um, thank you, Meg. Uh I'll share a little fun fact, maybe about myself. Um, I I started Avo Academy about four years ago. Um, so going four years strong with Avo Academy. At this time, I have an unhealthy obsession with pickleball. So you can find me playing pickleball four to five times a week for multiple hours, hours a day. Um, but I'm excited to to talk today about design, AI, career changes, and and all of that good stuff that you have in in store for us. Awesome. Thank you so much. I can't wait to hear about it because honestly, I know basically nothing about pickleball and probably a little bit less about UX UI design. Um, so I'm really excited to learn today. 
So obviously the subject of today's talk, um, we're gonna be talking about ways to kind of future-proof your career. Um, and one of the ways we wanna talk about it is some of the opportunities within UX, UI design, as well as AI. Um, could you tell us some of the different career paths that might be available for someone if their interests lie in this field, especially if they're interested in the integration of AI? Yeah, so in, in the world of UX, UI design, there's, there's a lot of different roles that someone can pursue. Um, there's uh, UX roles, there's UI roles, there's user research roles. And when we start thinking about AI, um, you can be a UX designer for AI products or a UI designer for AI products or a user researcher for AI products, or you can not do any of those roles for AI, but you can design with AI. So I think it's helpful to differentiate the two, right? As a designer, you can use AI tools to speed up your workflow, to help you do things faster, to get more ideas, come up with content, or you can be a designer that actually designs the AI um, products. So although people you know, get really scared when we start talking about AI and they think everything's changing and you know, AI is gonna take over the world, um, being a designer for AI products um, only makes it a little bit more fun. Like we get to design things that are very different than what we were maybe designing, you know, four or five years ago. Very cool. I, I really appreciate kind of the distinction there. Um, now, obviously, as we're talking about UX, that's user experience. UI is user interface. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So UX is really how things work. Um, if you think about um, how you know, but you would maybe go through like a government website to renew your driver's license, right? It's it's how it's the steps you take to to complete an action, while UI is how things look, right? So maybe Airbnb's website looks awesome and very modern, and maybe that government website I mentioned doesn't look as as modern, um, but that would really be the UI, right? How, the user interface, how how does it look? Okay, all right, I like this. Um. All right, so if people are looking to leverage their existing skill sets and they're trying to transition into a UX or a UI design role, um, what should people know about making that change? You know, there's a ton of people looking to pivot into tech right now. Um, what should they know about this, this transition? Yeah, so we really do think that a transition, um, a career transition can really be broken down into sort of three steps. So I would say the first one is learning, right? Like learning what UX design is, learning how to do some of the deliverables, learning how to use some of the tools. Um, we think the second step is getting some, some real world experience under your belt. So, you know, learning, watching YouTube videos, doing a course is very different than when you're working with a client, you're working with a product, you're, you're actually hands-on getting experience. And then the third step is is really like looking for a job, right? I'm sure you all are familiar and all the folks here looking for a job in itself is like an entire different world world of things. How do you hold yourself accountable? How do you complete applications? How do you stand out? So when people start thinking about a career change, once you've decided, those are really the three steps. It's like learning, getting some experience and then doing the, the job application. If, if they haven't fully decided yet, it's it's really thinking about their their skill set. What, what's their current job right now, and will their skill set kind of align? Like, are they a curious person? Um, you know, someone that likes to problem solve and and, and things like that. But really, yeah. UX designers can work in any industry, right? We have um, we've helped healthcare workers, nurses get jobs at companies like United Healthcare, right? Designing apps for a healthcare company. Um, we've helped teachers get jobs at ed tech companies, so education technology companies, designing applications to help students learn right on their iPads in school. So any job, any industry, there's tons of companies that hire UX, UI designers. It's not only the big tech companies, right? A lot of people think tech and they think meta, TikTok, right? Like they think the, the tech companies, yeah. but really every company, like dish home depot like there's so many companies that that hire designers so any experience that they have can be valuable in in that career transition yeah absolutely i mean this is something we talk to people a lot about when they're they're thinking of transitioning careers right because it's really easy to to kind of go from 
this role in this field to same role in a different field. And it all like, it already feels so completely different, but I think you're right. You know, it is really valuable to make sure that you don't lose track of like, oh, I have great knowledge and a great background and skill set in this industry. What else can I do within that? Like, I, I very much like where this is going. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about some of the certifications. Like there's a lot, the, the, I feel like the big question that we get asked is like, okay, so then what do I do first? Where do I learn? You know, but are there any certifications or like specific training programs that you would recommend for someone who is, you know, looking to enter UX, UI design, as well as, you know, in conjunction with AI? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm a little biased because we, we teach it, but I, I think I can answer this question in, in two parts. The first is if you're not sure and you haven't quite like said, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, I would highly encourage folks to take some sort of free course, some sort of short course. Um, you can find these in, in all sorts of websites. Uh, Coursera has a, a free course. We, we have Academy have a free course as well. It's only three hours. Um, helps you like, you know, figure out, learn what the roles are, get some definitions. Skillshare has courses, Udemy, right? Like all of these um, kind of like short course platforms have some great courses that you can do to just figure out like, is it for you? Is it something you you want to pursue? Mm -hmm. um, once, once you've made that decision, there's a couple of different ways that you can, you know, do complete that first step of, of learning and you could go back to school and do like some sort of master's program. And that's typically the most expensive route. Um, you're looking at like 30 to 50,000 you know, US dollars for, for that. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can go, you know, all the way the free route, right? YouTube education, um, YouTubing some things and trying to learn on your own and trying to, you know, follow some tutorials. That's actually what I did when I transitioned careers about eight years ago. Um, so, well, it's actually a tiny, it's a long time ago. I won't do the math now. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can teach yourself um, or you can go some somewhere in the middle, which is the boot camp space, right? So um, boot camps can go anywhere from 2000 to $24,000. And, and these boot camps are really gonna help you do the learning. Some of them like ours help you get the experience and then actually help you get a job they'll have the curriculum, right? So you don't have to feel alone and kind of figure it out on your uh, by yourself. Um, in terms of AI, we have not seen a lot of courses like the one that we're launching this month, which is how to design uh, for AI products. A lot of the boot camps have incorporated how to use AI, right? Like how to use ChatGPT to help you answer some questions, how to use some tool with you know accessibility or different things like that. Um, but I think we're one of the first courses that help you design for AI products, right? So how do you take the design process? How do you account for, you know, the, the user AI trust of, of, you know, people don't trust AI products? How do you make sure um, you're including the presentation and, and all of the fun things that, you know, AI products can bring? Um, so yeah, I, again, I'll be biased, but I'll say, I think our course is really gonna knock it out of the park when it comes to teaching people how to design AI products. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Rhea is sharing the link um, for that course right now. So if you are interested, definitely check out the the chat box right now. Le Rhea is sharing links in there to where you can uh, learn some more about what Maka is talking about from Avo Academy. Um, and I really like what you had talked about earlier about YouTube University, because you can learn a ton of things off of YouTube. There are tons of very talented people who will teach you all kinds of cool stuff. And that is like one of my favorite ways to tell people to get started, right? Is this idea that like, you don't have to throw good money after bad. Like don't throw money at it to begin with, kind of get your feet wet, see what might interest you or might not before you then think like, oh, okay, what I really want to throw money at is this, or this is the area where I really need help. Um, yeah. And I love it. Oh, go ahead, please. <laughs> no, I was going to say on YouTube, something that really, really helps people make the decision to, to start the transition um, is these like day in the life videos of people actually showing what it's like to be a designer, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, we always encourage people to to check those out to see like what it's actually like to be a designer. What would you be working on? Um, how many meetings you'll be on, right? Like truly what what it looks like to to be a designer. Like it, okay. Um, all right, let's kind of talk a little bit more about the role of AI within the design space. 
Um, what kind of impact are you seeing AI making, especially when it comes to things like the design tools, the processes, you know, like prototyping and wireframing? Like, how does that all change when you add AI into the equation? Yeah, I think, you know, we're we're seeing a lot of tools emerge every week, right? Like the, the space changes so fast in terms of um, how how fast new things come come out um we're we're seeing some some cool you know the main design tool figma has some cool features that allow you now to like generate content and kind of like move through the process a little bit faster so what we are seeing is a lot of like individual tools that help you uh be more creative that help you make decisions faster help you analyze data so for us, some some specific examples is we're able to take um, you know user survey data and put it into ChatGPT with like a lot of specific prompting and get empathy maps right. Get some of the deliverables that maybe would have taken like a lot longer to do. Um, so we're able to really speed up our day to day process when designing using these tools. Um, creating imagery for wireframing right. Like you can use some of these cool AI tools to just be like I need a picture of you know, a person doing yoga in the park for my yoga, you know, studio class app. And you're able to get some really cool images very quickly where before we were kind of all using the same stock images to to put into our designs or in our wireframes. Um, same thing with uh, prototyping, right? Prototyping um, tools have, have been changing a lot. And I, I think the, the main thing we're seeing as we design AI apps is a lot more... Um, movement towards like chat and voice apps that for a while, you know, not a lot of apps were incorporating that conversational aspect into their applications. Ooh, you're muted, Meg. How often do I host these? And I always lose my mute button at least once. Um, no, I love what you're saying about, about kind of opening up possibilities and giving you some more options. But I also love that this could also open up huge options in terms of accessibility, right? Because if you are talking about being able to use things like voice function a lot more, then you are able to, you know, you're able to have that app being used by people who might be, you know, visually challenged, people who might, you know, need that that um, that audible like, you know, interaction. I think that's wonderful. Um, all right, let's talk about some of the ways that AI is being utilized within UX UI design. I'm, I'm especially keen to see how it really differs from some of the traditional methods. Um, you know, you talked about wireframing earlier, but what are some other examples of this? Yeah, um, I think I think the the image example that I was giving, right? Like we can now create these these specific images um, of whatever it is exactly that we need, so that we create you know much much higher quality designs. Um, the the being able to process large amount of data, right? I I remember when I was working as a designer, like we could spend a whole week looking at survey data and having, you know, like putting sticky notes in a room and trying to figure out like what were some of the common themes or some of the common pain points. We can now kind of like put all of that data into ChatGPT or any of the other, you know, tools and really get some insights really, really quickly to help us really spend time on, on what matters, right? Like designing more options, testing the designs instead of spending so much time kind of like analyzing data and, and things like that. So I really think, you know, I, I see a lot of articles about how like, you know, in, in the world of AI, there's, there's not gonna be any more designers. There's not gonna be any more, you know, creative roles. But I really think that if used correctly, AI can give us the ability to do the stuff that really matters to make more of an impact, right? Before we might spend half a day or a day designing a feature because we were spending time doing research or spending time on other things that now we can speed up and spend a lot more time like truly testing things, right? We're focusing on accessibility, focusing on, on things that in the past, like we wouldn't have been able to, to spend the time on. I love this. And I think it's also really important to highlight, you know, when when we're talking about AI, you're right. The, the initial conversation is very, it's full of a lot of fear, right? It's full of a lot of like, oh, they're coming for our jobs. It's like, okay, well, we said this about computers like 30 years ago too. Yeah. So everybody can chill. But like, it also, I think kind of highlights the fact that it's always going to be something. 
And it's the fear of the unknown. So the easiest way to fix fear of the unknown is to learn a little bit about it. And honestly, my whole idea and like the way I thought about AI completely changed when I was listening to one of our speakers and she said that AI isn't a, isn't a what, it's a how. So it's not like, oh, we're going to solve this and AI is going to do it. It's like, no, 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 we're going to solve this issue using AI and that's how we're going to get to what we need the solution to be. Um, and so I think it was, it, it really changed how I thought of it. And so maybe it'll help others as well. Um, but yeah, like it, we got to stop thinking of this in terms of like, in, in terms of like changing the industry for the negative. It's like, no, 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 no. There's going to be these improvements. This is like the first that we're going to keep seeing. Like these changes are only going to keep coming faster and faster like they have been for the last 20 years. So I think it's really cool that we're, we're diving into this in a way that's like, no, this doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be weird. It, it's something new to learn. Let's figure yeah. out what we can do to make it work for us best. Yeah, I think it's a really great opportunity to like experiment and like change the way we work, which in the past we maybe didn't like take the time to do that. But even as uh, like design, just, you know, a basic design software, Sketch used to be, you know, the design software we all used. And then Adobe XD came and everyone was like, oh no, we have to learn a new software. And like, we learned a new software. Then Figma came along, right? And now Figma is like the big powerhouse of design software. It's the same thing, right? As as we learn, you know, as new softwares came out with new functionalities, we learned how to use them. Um, it's it's just now moving a lot faster. So we have to just keep learning and keep seeing like, okay, this this product is awesome. Let's keep using it. This one sucks. Let's not use that again, right? Like you, it's, yeah. it's about continuous learning, even as you become a designer and, and able to have access to all these tools that are being released almost weekly, honestly. It's, it's pretty exciting in, in my eyes, yeah. Yeah, it sounds wild. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the tools that you would recommend for people trying to conduct accessibility testing um, within UX UI design projects. What should people know about this? Like, and what, what do you think are some of the better tools for it? Yeah, um, there's there's always been some cool tools that like automate things. So like you can you can put in a Figma design and it shows you um, contrast and it shows you some of the more technical things. I think now with uh, AI tools to help speed up the process, um, there's there's two that I, you know we've we've sort of tried have not we didn't dive super deep into these. So I'm just putting them out there so so people try them out. Um, but there's one called Excessive B and one called Audio I, and I think they both they both use um vision is like the cool term that <laughs> uh, people use to actually like look at the page and inspect it in a different way um than like the old old school traditional accessibility tools would use um but yeah there's there's probably so many more out there so if, if anybody has any recommendations would love to to see them in the chat as well um as yeah. like i said these these tools are like changing almost weekly and even tools that we've been using in the past are just releasing, you know, AI features within within the tools as well. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, all right. So let's let's kind of take a step back here and talk about, um, you know, kind of from the perspective of somebody who's new to the field. Um, if you are just transitioning in, what do you think are some of the essential skills that are required? That like you, you really need to have these um, in order to excel in UX UI design especially if you are keen on integrating AI into your projects? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people have a misconception that you have to be an artist to be a UX. Like they hear designer and they think like, you know, someone painting, you know, a mural on the street or, or something like that. Um, it's very much, I would say, not, not a, um, a creative field in that way where you have to know how to draw or you have to know how to paint. Um, I think I would say key skills are really like problem solving and curiosity. If you're someone that's like on your phone or on your computer and you're like, why is this working this way? Like why, you know, why is it not working? Or it would be much better if we had the button here instead of here. Um, someone that's just constantly asking questions about why things are done the way they are is probably a great fit for a UX UI designer. And I think uh, along with that is really like the critical thinking um, and like empathy side of things, like understanding how people experience things, why they experience them, and being able to understand problems from their perspective, because design is really just understanding how, like the problem that's being experiencing and, and solving that problem for the user. 
uh, for a long time, that meant designing a website or designing an app. And, you know, as we move into the AI world, it might be designing, um, you know, a mixed reality, right? AR apps for those fancy Apple goggles or any of the, the new devices that will come out or designing voice assistants, designing chat interfaces. Um, so really, I think like if you're curious, if you have empathy um, and if you're creative in the way you think, if you're like, oh, this could be done this way or this could be done the other way, um, those are like some good kind of skills, you know, boxes you'd be checking and be like, okay, maybe I should dive deeper into this and see if this could be a, a career for me. Yeah. And y'all, let's just take a second here to announce and highlight the fact that nothing that Maka just said was considered a hard skill. So let's just talk from the jump about how fabulously important and transitory soft skills can be. And let's also talk about the fact that we're talking about like the key skills you need. And the first things you listed were problem solving and curiosity and open-mindedness, critical thinking and communication skills. Those are huge y'all, like very, very, very transit, like um, transferable skills. So I love where this is coming from. And you're right, that, that curiosity, cause like, it's not enough to just be like, ah, this isn't that great. It's to be like, this isn't that great. Why isn't it that great? What would it take to make it great? What could it take to make it slightly less sucky? You know, like what, where do we need to go with this? Um, yeah, we, and I think that's awesome. We we really do believe that like the hard skills, the technical skills, we we can teach them, right? Like those are things you can learn. Um, at at Apple Academy, we've helped someone in their 60s, like who didn't know how to copy paste on a computer, like learn how to copy paste and then actually design an app by the time they were done, like a full Figma prototype of an application 16 weeks later. So I think we're, we're really confident that we can teach, right? And that you can learn the hard skills because if you can follow instructions, we can show you click here, click here, do this, right? No, that's wrong. Let's do it again, right? It's it's kind of a, a process of, of teaching the hard skills. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's these soft skills that, are eventually going to make you a great designer, going to make you good at the field, and are, are going to allow you to enjoy the career, not only be able to to do the job. Yeah, no, I think this, this is very, very important because you're right. You know, it's not just about getting up to speed and and making sure that you know what you're doing in the field. It's also making sure that that's where you want to be, right? Like it is, and that can be really scary, especially if you're already looking at the transition part. It's really easy to just focus on the part that's that's you know, more tangible, right? It's like, okay, great. I'm going to have to learn these skills and blah, blah, blah. Whereas like kind of making sure like, oh, am I going to be happy here? Like that's a little bit more nebulous of a process. There's not necessarily, I mean, there are, but not necessarily a bunch of checklists that come to mind of like, okay, yeah. And I got to make sure that this all lines up. Um, yeah. All right. So let's say you, you've thought about these things. You want to move into a designer role. Um, how can individuals start developing a portfolio of work? You know, you want to showcase what you can do. Um, but how should people think of that in terms of developing a portfolio? Yeah, I think that's an awesome question. Uh, you need a portfolio to be able to find a job in this field. It's like a, it's it's just as important as a resume in, in the design world. So um, awesome question. I, I think I can walk through maybe three different sort of options. Uh, the first is to do like an individual learning project. So uh, pick a problem you want to solve and just kind of go through maybe like a, a linear design process so that you can learn in an ideal world what, you know, that project would look like and do some interviews, um, do, do some, you know, uh, user journeys and kind of wireframe and go through the whole process yourself with like this kind of fake problem or that you're solving to to create your own project. So that, that one, I think, is the most accessible one and the one that, like, if someone on this call wanted to start, they could do it as soon as they they drop the call, right? Just pick a problem and, and start going through the process and that way create something to put on your portfolio. Um, the second thing I would say is volunteer design work, right? Find um, friends and family that have businesses or business ideas. Um, find, um, there's a website called catchafire.org where uh, nonprofits post projects that they need help with, right? Go on there and, and find the project. Um, when I started, I would go on Craigslist and find people that needed website designs and um, design for them. I don't recommend that, but that's like, that is kind of, you know, the path. You, you find um, businesses, you find, um, you know, folks that, that want some work and don't mind that you're learning and that it's a learning experience that, that you can design for. And then I think the third option 
is uh, some of the certificate and, and learning programs. Um, for example, at Apple Academy, we have a career jumpstart program. And in that program, we run a studio and we get three to four designers and we find like top startups that want work done and you actually do work for real companies, right? So a lot of the boot camps, a lot of the programs give you some sort of connection to the, the real world. Um, in our program, we run like an actual design agency so that by the time you find a job, you you feel confident in in, in the job that you're doing. But I think these, you know, those three would, would really be um, the, the approach I would take, like DIY, pick a project, volunteering, or joining, you know, some sort of program like uh, the Career Jumpstart program we have. I like this. I like this a lot. Um, we've had other other guests on who have said similar things, um, especially when it comes to picking a project, right? Um, a lot of the ones that were really good suggestions that we actually got from, from uh, attendees in one of these events before, um, try your local library. They will have lines on small businesses, people who might also need help. You can come to the library to have them explain things like this. So that might be a good place to find people. Um, I had really good success. My friend is in UX UI design. I had really good success with her with, um, there was a women's leadership group within her city. She's in Columbus, Ohio. Um, another good one was the YMCA or trade schools. If you're talking to pe pe people like graduating trade schools, a lot of the time they're trying to start their own business and they might need something like this. Um, so just some ideas out there, y'all, if you are unsure where to start, um, those could also help you try to find somebody that would would really value your skills and give you some really great experience to make sure that you know what you're doing. Yeah, and Facebook Facebook groups are also really good for this. Um, there's a lot of Facebook groups of um, you know people trying to become or just starting their own I don't know therapy practice, right? So if you yeah. find like specific groups of people that are starting their own businesses and join it and ask if it's okay to post, you'll probably get a tons of people that are like would love a free website or, you know, some affordable website or, or work done um, by you for you to put on your portfolio. Yeah, I like this. Don't forget, y'all, we are we could live in a barter, like a, a barter society tomorrow if we wanted to. So I am 100% on board with, I know how to do this. You know how to do that. Let's trade. Yeah. So I think that's wonderful. Um, we did have a question I thought was really interesting um, that came from Nalita in the chat. Um, Nalita had said, what is your approach to helping new designers finding junior roles considering the current job crisis and they're looking for new opportunities? So you touched on this a little bit um, with telling us how y'all run basically uh, an, ad, like a, um, an agency within your school. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so our, our Career Jumpstart program, um, the, the first thing we do, so it's, it's three phases. The first phase, we teach some advanced design skills that we think help students stand out. And this is like, uh, prototyping skills that allow you to work with developers, skills that allow you to work with other designers, because in the real world, it's not just you designing, it's typically in, in a group of, of other people. So it, that's the first phase of, of that program. The second phase is about three months long and folks do two projects within the agency. So they work with two real clients, they work with PMs, developers, um, other designers to really get that you know real world experience. And then in the third phase, which is up to 12 months, we actually do like 12 months of hands-on helping folks find the job. So at this point, they have the real world experience, which already sets them apart from people that may be doing, you know, some of the free courses or some of the courses that don't have like such a comprehensive real world experience. And then um, those 12 months are all about techniques of like how many jobs per month to apply to holding each other accountable, creating community. Like I, I know people want to hear like the, the technical things, but like the job search is so difficult that I think just creating space for people that are going through the same process and are able to um, talk and talk about the roller coaster that is like rejections and applying to jobs and, and all of that um, is, is a big part of it. So for 12 months, every month, we have a set of activities that you're completing that are helping you they're, they're helping you figure out like your why, right? Like writing a future letter to yourself. Like there are some like actual emotional activities that we do as well as helping you figure out how to do cold outreach on LinkedIn, how to go to events like Power to Flies, uh, events that you, you all have hiring, you know, fairs and we share things about you all. Um, all sorts of, of tips and tricks on like how to continue pushing. 
Um, as, a, as a new designer, it's all about like, how do you frame your industry experience, right? Like if you worked, you know, in healthcare for all these years, or if you worked in marketing, right? How can we take that and make somebody like really want to hire you, really want you to stand out in their team? Mm -hmm. So with that does come unlimited mock interviews, right? We have yeah, a, a big part of, of the career coaching we do is like, how to get you to say that you are a designer, not that you are a healthcare worker or a nurse or that you are, uh, we had an opera singer in the past who was like, I'm an opera singer. And we're like, no, you're a designer, right? Like, so we work with- New lines, new lines, you're a designer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we work a lot on like building confidence, getting rid of that imposter syndrome. Um, and really like, as you start landing interviews, tweaking how you respond to interviews to eventually um, kind of land, land that role. Um, and I like, this. like yeah. the idea that y'all have 12 months of, of like monthly, like, Hey, here's the thing you could be doing now. That's massive, honestly. Like, and, and I know that you're right. Like the, the community building aspect, I feel like is something that people, they like chuckle over a little bit, but also like job searching is lonely y'all. It is lonely. It is isolating. It is a lot of negativity. It's a lot of no responses. And if somebody with like massive ADHD, that is not good for me. That's like a perfect storm. And so yeah. creating a, a community or at least being in the same room as people that you know are also going through this is so much easier. Oh my gosh. It doesn't matter how many friends or family you have helping you in your job search. If they're not also in the weeds of it, it can get, it can get a little dicey, right? It can feel like, like you're yeah. going to bang your head against a wall. So I'm sure that yeah. is invaluable. I love that idea. Yeah, we have we have daily calls. Folks can join to share their wins. We have Slack channels with uh, one. You know, here's my advice. I just landed a job. Um, but really, I think you know the the main differentiator for us is that I think other boot camps uh, have career services. Once you graduate, for us, like you are not graduated in our system until you find the job, right? Like we we make it our job for you to find a job. Um, and that's why we've we've designed the the twelfth month of of job search. Even though folks are really finding jobs within like four to six months, we we've made that for people that maybe it takes them a little bit longer. Maybe they have a full time job, right, or kids, or um, we really try and be accessible and um, accommodate everybody, no matter their their circumstances. Excellent. Okay. Um, all right, we've got about 20 minutes left in today's session. So if you have questions, oh, pardon me, y'all. If you have questions that y'all want to ask um, and you're not sure if we're going to get to them or, you know, you're not sure if we're, if we're going to be on that topic, make sure you go into that group chat, throw in any questions you have. We're grabbing all of the questions from the chat um, and we will try to make sure we get to all of them today. So if you've got questions, send them in, y'all. That is the easiest way to make sure that you get value from today's event. Um, all right. So let's talk about some of the, the the tools or practices that you have your junior designers focus on um, so that they can really attract those potential employers. Um, what should they know about like some of the, the tools that you would recommend? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people are really focusing on um, AI tools to speed up their workflow. And I think um, on, on our end, what we're really focusing is actually designing AI tools. So what's really gonna set you apart is knowing how to do uh, voice and chat interfaces, right? Like conversational design is, it's a whole different kind of monster of, of design skills. So we're making sure that designers going through our program understand the nuances between designing a chat application, designing a voice application. Um, how do you work with a developer to understand the constraints in designing something? Um, it becomes a little bit more technical as you work on these AI uh, products. So that's kind of what we we have people focusing on right now. It's like, can you understand the complexity of the technicalities of designing for AI? Um, the other thing I'd, I'd touch on is, well, maybe two more things. <laughs> the first is, uh, establishing like user AI trust, right? A lot of people, um, there's this fear around AI. So when you present an AI product to someone, they may be like, mm, how do I know it's right? Or eh, I don't know about that. So we really talk about that user AI uh, interaction, right? How do you make sure the user like trusts what, what you're putting in, in front of them? And the the last thing is prototyping and user testing. When you're designing these like voice or chat apps, it becomes a little bit more difficult because it's not just click, 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 go to the next screen, right? It's a conversation. So 
when you are uh, designing your user tests, you have to be much more specific and you may have to use like video recordings instead of like actual prototyping tools we've spent the last 10 years like <laughs> learning how to use. So we're really having our junior designers focus on these things because when you start interviewing, when someone asks you, oh, how do you prototype a, a voice app or a chat app? Knowing the nuances, the difficulties and saying, hey, I've, I've done that before. I've done it in this way. That's what is like a green flag for the employer. Like, okay, this person gets it. We don't have to teach it to them, right? Like they, they understand how difficult it is to design for AI. I think that's a really important thing, right? Because it, it it's really easy from outside of the field to think that like, okay, yeah, like you're just, instead of going from designing an app for Home Depot, you're going to go and design an app for um, the Disney store or something. But like, you don't realize that there's a lot of changes in between those two, right? It's not like making a hamburger here and making a hamburger here. It's like making a hamburger and then like a taco salad. Like, yes, they're both edible, but there's a completely different recipe that goes into them. And if you start trying to make your taco salad, like you start a hamburger, it's not going to be a taco salad. So yeah, I think it's, I, I very much like this, this kind of dr drilling down and trying to specify like, no, 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 I understand a lot of the nuances that go into this and here's the experience I have with it. So I think that's excellent. Love, yeah. love this. You're making me hungry with your examples, but yes. <laughs> Girl, me too. I literally, as I'm talking about it, I'm like, why are you saying taco so much? Now I have to get tacos. So if you have a great taco place, drop it in y'all. Cause we could always use uh, some, some love spread to some of our local taco places. Um, all right, so let's kind of, let's try and look forward a little bit. What do you think is going to be the role of UX UI designers as AI continues to grow as a, you know, as a, a force within the industry? Yeah, I think we, we briefly touched on this earlier, how there's this, um, you know, culture of fear around AI and like AI will take our jobs and like, um, you know, there's the, yeah, I think everyone's worried about AI taking your job or AI becoming the the walking, you know, I robot type of, of example. Um, but I don't, I don't think that that is a real possibility in the super near future. I think AI is really going to enhance um, like human capability, really, right? Like we are going to um, use AI to speed up some of our processes and then really focus on what matters. Like I, like I said earlier, right? Like spend more time designing, spend more time testing, spend more time, you know, designing for people with uh, disabilities, right? Spend more time on accessibility and, and testing. And then the other thing I like to say, because we get this uh, a ton, we have career advisors in our program and they're always coming to me being like, everyone's so worried AI is going to take take their job. Um, and, and ultimately what we say is like someone needs to design the AI tools, right? So if there's so much AI products coming out, someone needs to design them. So at minimum, right, you are going to need a designer to, to design those products. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think this is also kind of goes back to... The Sorry, all my dog was under my desk and just scared herself and scrambled out. That was that hideous noise. Um, no, I think that it, it really it really is important to kind of talk about that, right? Like we're, when we're talking about AI, we're not talking about true artificial intelligence, right? Like we haven't created Jarvis. It's a series of logic gates. So you still need people to talk to the computer, to tell the computer, here's what we're trying to do. Um, so I think that is really important to kind of, you know, like to, to specify here um, and really kind of goes to to putting aside some of those fears um, and trying to focus on some of the stuff that's like really going to be an impact going forward. Um, do you think that there are any trends that are going to really drive that AI design? Like, do you think that there are anything, any, any emerging trends that people should be aware of or they can follow to try and kind of get on the same track and see where this is going to go? Yeah, I think from a product standpoint, I would really focus on chat and voice, right? Chat and voice has been around forever, even before AI or large language models and like all of these things that existed. Um, I worked on an AI product five years ago before people were talking about <laughs> AI. So I would say chat and voice is really where I would point people to is like learn how conversational design. And then the, the other thing, um, that's more of like a soft skill would be like the continuous learning, right? Like getting into the habit of learning how to use the new tools. Oh, a new tool came out. Let me put one hour 
to aside to get the free trial and like try it out and see how it works. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's going to differentiate a lot of people, right? You have the people that are like, oh, I'll never use that to create images. And then you have the people that are like, yeah, I used it for an hour. It's not that great. Like maybe we won't, you, you know, we won't get the subscription for, for work. So I would say that the continuous learning um, in terms of the soft skills is really what I would focus on, right? Like making sure you're able to like get on a free trial, try it out, assess if you like the product or not, because things are going to change very quickly. There's going to be new tools and you don't want to miss out on some that can make you know, designing easier or can even give you inspiration for, for your own designs um, as you start designing AI products. No, absolutely. I mean, depending on the kinds of programs that you, you, you uh, come across or that you try out, I mean, that could mean completely different things for the, like, the journey of your own career. So I, I very much love this idea of encouraging that curiosity and then following your own curiosity, because like, if this is something you're actually interested in, it's going to be a lot easier to stay up to speed and, and up to date. And it's going to be a lot easier to try and keep seeking out these new things because you're already curious in this, in this way. Um, yeah. so I think that's wonderful. For, I think for designers that, you know, existing designers that are on this chat or, or listening to the recording, um, some question we get a lot from our grads is like, how do I make time to learn all these things? Like, how do I, you know, how do I stay up to date with everything, you know? And I think, um, it can be overwhelming when there's so so many new things to learn, but really it comes down to just like blocking 30 minutes, blocking an hour and being like, today I'm going to try this, right? And just trying one tool and not trying to like learn everything, learn every tool, learn learn all the things or signing up for like a bunch of 40 hour certifications, right? It's about just like trying the tools. Um, out of Academy, when ChatGPT first, you know, became public, I gave everyone the assignment that for like our Friday all hands, everyone needed to have tried it and like said what they loved and what they hated and like make a fun slide. Right. So it's, it's about that, right. Like just spending some time, just trying things out and and seeing how you you can learn. Um, all right. We do have a lot of people that are interested in transitioning into UX UI design and they're coming from a different field. Um, let's see one of the ones that we got today. All right. Um, Aradna, thank you for sharing this with us. Um, it from the chat wants to know if HR or marketing people could make a, a pivot into this field. Um, they're in their in their forties. Um, so you've talked about some of the different places your your trainees have come from and different pivots that they've made. Um, do you think that there are there are any uh, transferable skills in this that are especially helpful? I mean, like I know we talked about communication. That to me alone says HR and marketing right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like it's. It's not like you're the only person that's ever come out of HR and marketing, right? That's the other thing I try and remind myself is like, not that you're not special, but like, I'm not special. I'm I'm personally not, all right? I'll take that on myself. So like somebody else has to have done this before me. So yeah. I like, I really like this question. Um, what do you think people should know if they're if they're fully trying to make a transition, they're trying to pivot into something from something that was not Ted? What, what do you think they should know here? Yeah, I think, you know, the focus on the soft skills is the first thing, right? Um, I think the comment here says my math is not very good. You do, Your math does not need to be good, right? As long as you can think logically and you can ask questions, like you don't need to code, you don't need to, you know, be great at math or solving algorithms or anything of, of that sort. And on the same spectrum, like you don't need to be an artist, right? You just need to be kind of creative in, in the way you think. Um, so for this specific question, HR and marketing, perfect storm for transitioning into UX, UI. You have experience with communication, you have experience um, talking to clients, deliverables, right? Like the marketing world is very, very similar to the design world. So it's it's definitely, you know, a good fit there. Um, and I love that you mentioned creating your kids' birthday invitations. Like you have like the creative side down as well. Um, so I would definitely say like, try it out. Um, I, I would check out our website. We have free resources. We have a free course, like sign up for that free course. Um, it's a lot of me explaining what UX is, what UI is and, and going through it. I think that would definitely be uh, my move uh, for you specifically. I think a high level advice, it's really um, think about your current experience. So in this example, right, HR and marketing and how you can use that in, in your advantage, right? Like, do you have those soft skills to be able to be successful? And then um, just make sure you understand that this is not like an overnight transition, right? Like this is not like a 
get rich quick scheme. Like this is a career change, which comes with like an identity, you know, restructuring of sorts. Um, so I would say like prepare to work hard. Uh, it's definitely worth it, right? Like we we hear it time and time again. I did it myself. It was definitely worth it. And I think my last piece of advice is just to be kind to yourself, right? It's a career change. It's completely different. Um, so give yourself some of that grace and, and time um, to learn, to get some real world experience. And then ultimately that job search, um, I think needs a lot of kindness in, in, in exploring that. Yes. Oh my gosh. Kindness to yourself and, and resiliency during the job search will take you a lot further than, than anything else. And at least in my opinion, I've had a lot. Oh my gosh. Sometimes I feel like I've been searching for jobs longer than I've actually like had a career in anything. Um, and so really, truly, like, I want to, I want to highlight this because like job searching is not easy. It is a rough slog and you are not the only person that feels that way, even though it does feel like that. Um, so yeah, I completely agree with this. Like, you know, anything worth doing never happens overnight. Right. There's, there's a reason that like your mom, like your grandmother's chili tastes so good. And it's not because it came out of a can 20 minutes ago. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I I think it's, I gotta stop with the food. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, it's. I, we hear, you know, we have so many stories of people um, that have transitioned careers and like truly love what, what they're working on. Um, my, I think my favorite story is we had a hairdresser who was a single mom living in her mom's house. And um, she did our course two years ago, has had, you know, has had a job for over a year and a half. And we did a student meetup in Austin and she was like, I just bought my house. I just bought my own house. Um, and she was, you know, she's like, my my son and I are living in this beautiful house. She used to be a hairdresser and now is a designer, right? So even careers that you don't think there'd be a ton of, you know, overlap in terms of technical skills, like she was talking to people all day long, right? So she oh, can do that. let's let's just talk about that. If you tell me that you've been in retail, you've been in customer service, or you've been a teacher, I already know that you can do like basically everything I can do and probably 400 things I haven't thought of. Like those are, though. Oh my gosh, the amount of skills, multitasking, like the the different oh. knowledge you'd have to have, the communication skills alone. Like, yes, yes, yes I love yes, it. Yeah, teachers, teachers make up like 10% of the students in our program, actually, because like they and and they're super successful. They they deal with school staff, students, and parents, right? So multiple yeah. stakeholders, like they they've got it down pack. Um so, well, and like multiple like not necessarily like like education levels right but like like multiple different like areas of their job that they have to know how to discuss with different areas of the rest of the world I oh yes yes if y'all are concerned about transferable skills come and talk to us at one of these virtual job fairs you will you will absolutely see that transferable skills are everywhere um all right we've only got about five minutes left before we need to bounce but um what are some before we leave this subject are there any common challenges or misconceptions that about pursuing a career in UX UI? Um, and what do you think people should know about them or how to navigate them effectively? Um, yeah, I think the I'll cover a couple. So the the first one is that you need how, you need to know how to code, right? Or you need to know how to um, paint, right? Or be overly creative. Um, you you don't need to know how to code. Uh, you don't need to be good at math. <laughs> like th- those are not requirements, right? We went over today multiple times with, with that. It's really about those soft skills, the communication. Um, so so I would say it's that. Um, the other misconception I would say is that it's really easy, right? I think there were uh, in the last couple of years there were a lot of like free programs um, that came out, and people thought like, oh, if I just complete this this free, you know, six week program, I will become a designer. And it's, it's not that easy. Right. And I, I want to be, even as a owner of a boot camp, like I want to be super transparent that it is hard work. Um, you know, but if you put your, your mind to it and you dedicate time and, and you actually work towards it, it's something that is definitely doable. Uh, but it's not as easy as some of the marketing of, you know, some of, of the, the resources out there. So I, I think those are the main, main two things um the the last one would maybe be around saturation of the job market we get that question a lot which is like oh there's so many designers and not enough design jobs um i think for us something we we focus on there's a lot of people that have completed these free courses or like have done some sort of short term thing 
that are are calling themselves designers but might not really be at the level of someone that's ready to be hired right and i mean that in the most respectful way to these people that are, are trying to kind of get there um so i think you may have 200 applications for a job but maybe only 20 of those actually meet the location requirements and actually have portfolios so it may seem scary when you press apply and there's 200 other people but really it's it's a lot less when you start taking out people that are not qualified don't have a portfolio or just clicking on apply just to apply um so we we don't really think it's it's saturated when you really start looking at quality and like the requirements of a job um and I know you all are are familiar with that right because you work on on the employer side too I, I sit on so many employer uh, led meetings where they're like we can't find talent and I'm just like why is there I, so much on this side? <laughs> I love those conversations right we can't find talent and yet the job market's oversaturating like how do those two things work everything's going to be controlled by computers but also there's not enough jobs to go around again the math ain't math in, right that's not how these things work um no I love that I think you're right that is a very big concern and it's you know that is also something that people have to take into account right you know like like we talked about earlier you're you're going to make a major lifestyle change. This is a big shift. So think on it in those terms and, and understand that those are likely to come. Um, Let's see here. I'm trying to think, We make sure we got to all the questions. We did get one question I thought was really interesting. Um, Cosette, who I think goes by Cody, um, they had asked, they said, I'm more on the product side, but I want to learn how to better collaborate with my teammates to make stronger partnerships. What is something you wish product managers better understood about UX? So that's a bit of a loaded question. Um, <laughs> um, I think, you know, in, in the past, the best product managers that I've worked with understand UX period, right? So understand um, the process, understand designers. So I, I would really say if, if you are on, on the product side, do like a, a free course, right? That walks through like what it, it means to be a designer. Um, I think from the product side, from the design side, from the dev side, it creates a lot of dynamics where each person has something that's driving them. As a designer, it's always like user needs, like we want to do the best for the user. On the product side, it's typically business need, right? Like, oh, this stakeholder wants this thing. And on the dev side, it's typically like technical constraints, right? So when you understand what's driving the designer and what's driving um, the the developer, it makes it much easier to to communicate. Um, so I, I would say, make sure you understand UX, make sure you understand the process. Um, and I would maybe even read some of the books that I recommend to designers, which are articulating, there's a book called Articulating Design Decisions. And that is really the solution of like, how do you get the product side to understand design? So it could be <laughs> as a, someone on the product side to, to read that book and, and see kind of what designers are, are trying to accomplish. I like that. And honestly, I like the person that's even asking the question, right? If, if it's even a little bit on your mind that like, oh, I might not actually be understanding this as well as I think I do. You're already ahead of the game when it comes to the communication skills, right? Because like, that's not a it, that's not a thought that occurs to everybody. So the fact that you are thinking about it and it's not just a like I want to make my job easier. You're like no 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 I want to make these collaborations better. I want to make these these partnerships you know more more productive. Whatever your goal is, I think that's great. Um. All right, we've got two minutes left. In the last two minutes, we have what do you want to leave people with um, regarding Avo Academy or sorry, Av Academy. Um. What should they know? Where can they follow you? You know what can we tell them? Yeah, we, we have a ton of different programs. I think I saw earlier here, you know, do we help people from other programs? We definitely do. So if, if you're someone that's completed another program and are, are still in your job search, we encourage you to uh, take a look at our Career Jumpstart program. So that program, we take folks from all sorts of other programs, from our program to help you get experience, to help you get a job. Um, if you're someone that is considering a career change into tech, into UX design, uh, check out our website. We do have um, a free course, like I mentioned, and our free resources. I highly encourage you to take it. It's going to be three hours of your time. It'll help you kind of get in the mindset of, of what it's like to be a UX designer. Um, and I think if anybody here is really interested in designing AI products, our, our new course, and I know it's biased because I'm saying, but our new course is really going to be super amazing. It launches 
uh, April 22nd. And it's, uh, you know, UX UI design for AI products. We have a team of amazing, amazing skilled designers that are almost done with, with the content. And it's going to essentially allow you to create an AI product from start to finish. So really learn every step of the process. And, and that's open to anyone. So the number one question we get is, can I do this course if I don't know anything? And the answer is yes. We'll teach you what is UX, what is UI, and what is AI. <laughs> and walk you through through the process. So um, yeah, we have tons of resources. Just you know, check us out and, and reach out if y'all have any questions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Maka, so much for joining us today. This has been really, really great. I've loved getting to uh, to know a little bit more about UX UI as well as um, you know, learn more about App Academy. So thank you so, so much for joining us today. Of course, thank you for having me. All right, y'all, to all of our frequent flyers and anybody who might just now be joining or if you are new to today's event, we are so, so happy that you came out today to spend time with Power Fly and Av Academy. If you have any questions about any of the stuff we've talked about, my buddy Rhea has been sharing a ton of links in the chat thread. We'll also make sure that those links go out in the email that y'all get um, once this recording is posted to powertofly.com. So um, I hope that this was fabulous, that y'all enjoyed yourselves. I hope that if this was your first event, it will not be your last. And I cannot wait until we see y'all back here for another event soon. Bye.